Good evening and welcome back to Let's Play The Longest Journey. When we left off last time, we were continuing in Arcadia. I'm a little nervous about this because it's the next day and, you know, we've not been able to meet up with Cortez or anything. We're deviating from plan, but also not really a lot we can do because April doesn't know how to control her shifts yet. We just talked to a pretty interesting fella who doesn't live quite along the same timeline as we do. He experiences all moments at once, so that was nifty. Now, let's go get some more information. Okay, first off, we're feeling confident that I found all of the things that I need to find here, right? It's Audrey's long-lost cousin! <laughs> Good to know that uh, Little Shop of Horrors is still familiar to people a couple hundred years in the future. All right, let's go talk to Captain Nibibe. Because we need to ask about some stuff going on in the oceans, and he's the expert. All right, you. Hello. Or maybe the old man. Yeah, do you know anything about this god that fell into do the sea? Do you know anything about a god that fell from the sky into the sea? Of course. You find fallen gods most everywhere <laughs> these days. They're an air and a hand. Are you messing with me? Really? I can't tell. No, of course not. <sighs> There are no fallen gods in the sea. It wouldn't make much sense, would it? If the sea was full of gods just lying about the sea bed. Well, maybe the impact kind of got so them stuck there. you've never there. heard of such a thing happening? Now you got it. Very well, I will go talk to the old man. Bye. Okay, you've disappointed me, Captain Nibbe. I was hoping you were the guy. But since you are not, to the small pier. This fella knows stories. He'll be able to tell us all about it. Ooh, I wonder if he'll require his bird first. Or maybe he doesn't know and the bird's the one Hello that again, knows. Oh, old man. Eh? Eh? It be you. So, do you know anything about gods in the sea? No, not just a general story. Well, he does always ask. I'd love to hear some more maritime stories. Sure, sweetie, I'd be happy to. What story you be wanting to hear now? Come through for me, old fella. Oh, yeah. Have you heard a story about a god who fell from the sky into the sea? Aye, that I'd be having. Excellent. Although that be a story of man-eating mermen who ravage the sea of songs, swallowing sailors whole and spitting their bones out to dry. Ah, that kind of Are merman, you huh? Sure, you be up for hearing such a cruel tale? Absolutely. I've heard worse. Uh, ye be a tough little lady, be you not? All right. Well, like I be telling yous, the sea of songs surrounding the island kingdom of Gien, be it. Treacher the sea where countless vessels have disappeared without a trace. Didn't Nibbe say he's from Guyenne and he now, doesn't know anything about this? It's been near 30 long winters ago, mind, during me second term as captain of the trader, Rocky Lady. We've been crossing the Sea of Songs for two seasons, and we've yet to be seeing any sign of the dreaded bloodthirsty merman who lurk in the waters off the Guyenne coast. Well, you were on a... Lucky that ship, right? So. be laying still with our sails down, awaiting the wind to pick up and carry us north to Mercuria, when we be hearing a frightful scream coming from the port side of the Lady Luck. I be the first to rush over and account to me having me arm down the apple barrel. We just been to Eras to pick up one hundred barrels of sweet Guyenne apples. And as luck would have it, I be there just in time to witness Sally Barney's Horrible fate. Eaten by mermen? He be in the water, screaming and waving his arms, and the water around him be red as a midwife's arms after a grueling bath. I get the picture. Yep. Go on. Then I be seeing, I glimpse a large, shiny, sleek body be pulling Sally down and swallow him whole. It be the merman come to claim the body of the sailor who dared across their sea. All right, so where does the fallen god come into this? I'm sure it wasn't a shark. <laughs> what? This is a magic land, Big April. fish with sharp teeth and dead black eyes and a large triangular fin on top? Stop trying to impose Stark on you this. You mean a black-eyed snapjaw? Enjoy the magic. I guess it could have been. But it be no snapjaw. It be the dreaded merman of the Sea of Songs. 
Where does the sea god fit into all of this? Good question. I, I be coming to that. You see, the bloodthirsty merman be not only happy with cannibalizing sailors. Well, it's not really cannibalizing. But they be the sailors aren't also merman. Their dark old sea god. Right. Actually, oh well, if they sacrifice unless enough. the merman are human, <laughs> they wouldn't really be cannibals if they ate humans. Good call, April. Blood sacrifices to their dreaded god who lives on the bottom of the sea. Aye, that be the tooth of the merman, fierce and bloodthirsty cannibals of the Sea of Songs. Uh, thanks. Good story. No, keep falling gun. Aye. You, you didn't even tell me about the. Well, we got a diary entry, but. Well, oh no, he's saying the fallen god. Okay. Come on, Lavinia. The fallen god is their fierce and bloodthirsty god that lives on the bottom of the sea. So we fell there and he stayed there. Okay. Now, like she, I mean, it's it's reasonable for her to say, couldn't it just be sharks? Because she comes from Stark and that would be the thinking there. But April, wouldn't you kind of rather that it be fierce people eating mermen? I mean, sharks eat people. These mermen eat people. Isn't the mermen a little bit cooler? Don't you appreciate a little bit of fantastical elements in the world? All right. Uh, I think I'm good for now. Thank you. I'm all storied out for now. Thanks. Aye, you tell me when you want more, right? For sure. See you later. If I not be dead, aye. All right, you. So then... Oh, we have to wait a second while he does his getting back to business animation. Okay. To the pier. So, we could talk to th the our shady guy who's got the bird, but I have a feeling, I don't know, we don't, we just have coins. I'm worried we're going to just lose all of our coin if we try it. We could also go talk to Tobias, and that's probably a good idea, because I imagine he's got a fair chunk of information for us, you know. He's a pretty key religious figure here, so... All right. Uh, marketplace will get us there. And I still don't have a good feel for where Tom Wyatt is. Didn't notice her at the docks. Well, let's just talk to Tobias and maybe she'll turn up. Tobias, hello! It's me again. Good morning, Tobias. Why, it's April, my friend from Stark. Have you come to visit us again? More or less. So it appears. I didn't exactly come here by choice this time, though. Oh? How so, if I may ask? Accident. In a weird and twisted way, it's nothing out of what's become the substitute for ordinary in my life. One second I was in my room in Newport, the next I was in a dark alley in Mercuria. You must have opened a shift while you were sleeping. Good. This means you are learning to harness your magic. Well, subconsciously though, I'd rather be able yeah, to consciously I guess, do it. Except I don't think I'll be able to get back home again. And this time my mentor, Cortez, has no idea that I'm here. Well, hopefully he'll be able ah, to guess. But I'm sure you will find a way to channel and control your power soon. Yeah, we gotta stay optimistic. In the meantime, is there anything I can do to help? I need so much information, and I'm pretty sure you are gonna be the guy to talk to about that. So, I need to locate the disc that unlocks the Guardian's tower. The disc that is the key? Yes, it is needed. It might even restore balance, provided the new Guardian accompanies it to the tower, of course. But you wish to find the disc yourself? Well, yeah, to help out with everything. I have to. Cliché or not, it's our only hope. You uh, do this often, then? You know, save words? I'm the chosen one. Don't be snarky with me. It's an expression. Heroism in my world is more of a cliché than anything else. Okay, just a... I do not understand. That's okay. But then I am merely a servant of the balance, while you are... more. But yes, the disc. So do you know where it is? As I told you once before, when the Earth was divided, and the realm of the Guardian created, a disc was forged in the Well of Making. Okay. 
The disk was to serve two purposes, as a key to the Tower of Balance should it become necessary to enter it in the Guardian's absence, and as a replacement for the disk that is already in the Tower should it be broken. The Tower is now abandoned and locked, and the old disk shattered. So don't we need another replacement in case that ever happens again? I do again? think the time is right for After the we second disk to be brought forward and used. Okay, so where is it? Where is the disk now? At first, more than 12,000 years ago, it was kept in the open, at the Sentinel Enclave outside Mercuria. However, when thieves attempted to make away with a disk, it was taken away. The story is familiar, yeah. Where was it taken Why? to? So that it couldn't be stolen. So that the four parts of the disk could be divided amongst four of the magical people of Arcadia. People who would have nothing to gain from the balance being compromised. Oh, that's clever. All right, so who's got the pieces? What people were the disc divided among? Oh, that's exciting, because it sounds like it means we'll be going this places I other than Markeria. What? I'm not sure anyone remembers now. Oh. But it would be in the scriptures, I am certain. What scriptures? The scriptures of the balance. There are 13 of them. 13 is a strong number, rich in tradition and... Did you know the Ired High Council consists of 13 ministers? No, of course you don't. 13 was also the number of the fathers who begat the Sentinel and who built the Tower of Balance. Okay, 13 notwithstanding. Um, do you think you could look through the scriptures for me and figure it out? Oh, I gotta do it myself. All right, where do I find some scriptures? Where can I find the scriptures of the balance? Pay a visit to the Sentinel Enclave. Located outside the city to the east. Ooh. The great library of the Enclave contains every book ever written by an Arcadian Minstrom, and most others as There was well. another book we needed. Speak with Minstrom Yerin, the keeper of books. Tell him I sent you. Will do, thank you. Now then... I need to find the entrance to the Guardian's realm. There is one. You are right in that, but where, I would not venture to guess. You don't have any kind of idea? In the past, when the time came for the Guardian to step down and another to take his or her place, the Guardian opened a gateway wherever it was needed. Hmm. That's a problem. A Guardian, still in full control of the balance, can invite anyone in and let anyone out. But with the Guardian gone, the only way in would be the point where the divide was first created where the tower was built. Do we have any idea where that is? Isn't that location written down somewhere? Oh, it's just lost to legend now, Remember huh? Remember that this was done on the old Earth before the Divide. Like 12,000 years ago divide, or something. After the Divide, after the creation of Stark and Arcadia, places were shifted about. This entrance may not even be on the ground anymore. Mm. What do you mean? Like it could be up in a mountain, or it, it could be buried could be by there, water. In the sky, or far below us, through the crust of the earth into the molten depths below. I cannot say, and I do not know anyone who could. Maybe dragons? They're old enough, right? We could ask a dragon. Isn't there any way to locate the entrance to the Guardian's realm? Perhaps with careful investigation of the old texts. Histories of Arcadia, of the Divide, the Scriptures. I do not know, April, but it cannot hurt to look. I'll look, but mostly Again, I'm thinking dry it can't going to be the way to go there. At the Sentinel Enclave, speak with Minstrom Yerin. Alrighty. And then... I need to locate the two dragons that reside in Arcadia. The dry kin? Yep. What's the difference? Dragon, dragon, whatever. Dragons is a word from your world. The kin are not what they have become in your legends and fairy tales. Uh, potato, potato, it's fine. But they're real, aren't they? Oh, as real as you and me, April. And old. They have been here since before our time. As you probably remember, the kin were instrumental in the divide. Saving mankind from a terrible end. Yes, in which case, they probably have a better but idea where all I this stuff so we little. need are. Only what I can remember from my studies when I was a minstrel at the Enclave. Okay, so... Where are they? How can I get more information on the Drakkin? Give me the little info you got. Books, daughter, books. The wisdom of the ages. 
There is one tome you should study, called The Secrets of the Dry Kin, by Minstrom Elniak. It is old but informative, and it captures the imagination. Where can I find this book? Again, you yep. will find these texts at the Sentinel Enclave. Speak with Minstrom Yeri. Okay, Sentinel Enclave it is. I gotta say that, Tobias, I know you mean well, but it's a little frustrating that you keep... Books, books, go read these books, go do this research. Like, okay, there's a thing to be said for doing your own research, but at the same time, we're kind of on a tom time crunch. There's a lot of pressure. I'm trying to save worlds. Do you think maybe you could do some research for me? It could really help move things along. All right, all right. No, got to do it ourselves. Okay. Well, thank you for the information that you gave me. I should ask about getting... Well, okay, we'll ask. I need help getting back home. Unfortunately... I'm in no better state today to help you shift than I was the day before yesterday. You are the one with the talent, and so you must learn to use that talent. Yep. All right, so thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Good to know I could help you, April. Yeah, I'm, at any rate, it sounds an awful lot like we're going to have another um, where to go in the city option, so that's handy. All right. I'm going to try. I have a feeling that the game wouldn't be cruel enough to use up all my money. So we do have this pile of coins. So let's just try it once with the cups guy and see what happens. If I'm wrong and I do lose all my money, well, it's going to be disappointing, but we'll deal with it. No, no, get over here. Over here. So. Give it a shot. Just one coin. Here's my coin. Now, how do I play? I place one cup on top of your coin, like so. Which, I didn't even see my then coin. I shuffle them, like so. Now, you guess which cup hides your coin. If you get it right, you win another coin. Three in a row, and you win a prize. Huh. Ugh, very well. I have absolutely no idea, so I'll just take a wild guess and choose this one. Looks like you've yeah. got the wrong cup! It happens! A one in three chance, you know. But with coin in your pocket, you can always try again. Uh-huh. It's a talking bird. I'll talk to it. I look like a serving maid. You look fine. The shirt's cute. I wouldn't be too into the pants. They look like they're stained already. I do my best to never wear anything white because I'm really messy and I will stain it up fast. But I like the shirt. Yeah! The Enclave. Well, let's go right over there. See what it's all about. Nifty looking place. Stone wall. Some kind of sandstone. Very malleable, but also very vulnerable to the elements. These cliffs probably have huge, naturally formed caves and tunnels. That seems like a really bad place to store a bunch of books. Right next to the ocean? What if there's ever a hurricane or something and you have these easily eroded walls? Wouldn't just all the moisture in the air get in and damage the pages? I mean... It's a magic world. It's a magic world. They probably have safeguards. It just seems like tempting fate to keep it right next to a gigantic body of water. Oh, that's a dragon. It's a stone dragon gazing down into the center of the dome like it's guarding the entrance. It's a magnificent piece of work. I can kind of see. Here's his tail. Some legs. Is this giving you inspiration, April? For your art project, huh? Okay, so this is how we get in, huh? Oh, that's its head. Very clear water. It's emerald green, teeming with life and carrying the pleasant salty scent of distant shores. All right, anything else to check out? Oh, we got downstairs. So the, dra the dragon's mouth is pointing straight down at the middle of the floor. Okay. It's a circular hollow about 20 centimeters across and about 5 centimeters deep. Is this the tower? To get to the Guardian's Realm? We have a dragon. It's staring right at this spot. A suspicious circle. 
picked a small recess about the size of my fist with a thin duct extending from the recess to the circular hollow in the middle of the floor. So there we... are three others just like it, uh -huh. arranged with equal distance to each other in a circle and all connected via a duct to the center of the floor. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's awfully suspicious. This is the place, isn't it? All right, there's our other guy that we got to talk to. But first, yeah, I mean, man, water everywhere around all of these precious, precious books. Guys. I'm concerned about your bookkeeping choices. All right, wasn't I the one just chiding her about sharks and mermen? Let's roll with it. They've got magic spells on them, I'm sure. It's Arcadia. We're not home. It's fine. Can I get past him? Oh, I can. Okay, we're going to talk to you, fella, but first, I just want to look around. It's a pool of seawater. You'd think that it'd be a bad idea to have a pool inside a library on account of the moisture, but I guess magic makes everything possible. Huh. Dip a hand in, see what you think. Ooh, a wheel. We probably shouldn't mess with that, but I'm going to. The water is pretty cold. All right, to this wheel. It's a rusty wheel. Won't move. It's stuck. And I'm not really sure why we'd want it to move, but okay, we could try this screwdriver, maybe. Sort of lever it into there? No, it's not. It's not shining. It's not going to do. Okay, let's go talk to this fella. Ask him about all kinds of books and stuff. It's one of the Sentinel Minstrum. Hello, I was told I should talk to you. Oh. Didn't mean oh, to startle you. Goodness me, I didn't hear you come in. Uh, by the way, you haven't seen volume six of the complete annotated history of the Northlands, have you? Nope, sorry. I, I could have sworn it was here yesterday. Sorry, no. I guess someone else must have taken it. <clears throat> I try to tell them to write down what they borrow on the list, but they never listen. Who's borrowing? Is this like a public library? Only last week I spent three hours searching the entire enclave for the second scripture of the balance. The scripture of Saul. He has the freaking scripture? Before I realized that Vestrum Tobias was studying it back in the city. Is he just forgetful? He's not double-crossing me, is now, he? Such incidents could be avoided if only... And uh, this applies to you, too, young lady. People would sign out the books they borrow when they borrow them and sign them back in when they're done. I love libraries. I am Such on board with you. Such a simple procedure. It shouldn't take more than a few seconds to jot down your name and the name of the book you borrow. It makes my job so much easier. These are all fair points. Uh, now, which book did you want me to find for you? I need a couple. So, well, first off, are you Minster Yaren? Yes, of course. Oh, what a silly question. Well, I'm kind of new to this world, so... What would I know? I don't know you. I am Minster Yaren, keeper of the great library of Mercuria. In fact, this is the greatest library of all the Northlands. Perhaps of the entire world. Although they say the Dark People have a library as big, if not bigger, than this one. But of course, we're not allowed anywhere near there. Why is that? Have you been there? No, but I'd like to go there. I don't think... What a silly question. Of course you haven't. You're not of the Dark People, are you? You don't look like any dark people I've ever seen, so I can't see how you could possibly... Listen, I actually have questions I need to ask you. Now, where did Volume 6 disappear to? Don't you get distracted. Listen. Tobias said I should talk with you. Is he going to refuse until Tobias? I go get that book back? Vestrum Tobias? Uh-huh. I haven't seen him for... Well, he was in last week, but before that it must have been... Uh, days, at least. So, you see him kind of regularly? Is still eating enough for two mules? Probably, I, I'm not sure. I must tell you of this funny story I heard the other day. Of how Vestrum Tobias eats enough for a table full of minstrum. 
Uh, or was it one Elguan? Although the Elguan don't, as a rule, eat very much at all. <laughs> oh, this fella. Okay. Did you know that the Elguan can smell water more than half a day's journey away? That seems useful. Amazing. Amazing creatures. Perfectly suited for life in the desert. The balance provides. Uh, that's for certain. The balance provides. Elguan, huh? Okay, so anyhow... April, you gotta learn to be way more concise with the questions that you're asking and the responses you give to people. It'll cut out a lot of the unnecessary. I have a feeling that this guy's meant to be just kind of rambly, and it might sort of grate on her nerves, and she might potentially lose her temper. The way around that, April, is to just be direct about what it is you need. Vestrum Tobias recommended that I look at some books. I mean, that's uh, part of it, but is what we do give some best names here and at stuff. The Enclave. That is for certain. Which book would you like to see? All right, I need a whole bunch. I do want... I'm looking for a story called The Silver Spear of Goriman. Yes, a fanciful tale if I ever saw one, but a charming one. Did you know that I'm often paid visit by adventurers wishing to read everything available on the spear so that they too can set out on their foolish quests? Why do you think the quests are foolish? Yeah, don't you just hate those adventurers? <laughs> Well, they pay for my bread, milk, and butter with their contributions to the coffers, so I shouldn't be too critical of them. Uh, but they care not about the books. They care only about what the books can give them. Well, I care about the books, really. <laughs> this is a charming lie from tell. April the Self-Professed so, Book Hater. the Silver Spear of Gurimon, then? Yep, among others. I'm going to be asking you a lot of stuff, buddy. Get ready for it. This mo oh yeah, this is I'd be excited. A whole other world's books, some of them are ancient and stuff. Awesome. I want to wade through it. But for her who doesn't like reading books anyhow, it's got to be a bit torturous. I did find something of interest. I'll leave it here for you to read. Thank you. Okay, before I ask him about anything else then, I think I'd better check this out cuz what if he brings out a different book each time? So, let's and go I look at this book. Like a serving maid. No, not you, the book. What do we got? The Silver Spear of Goriman. In the glory days of Bakshiva, before the drought, when Goriman was the greatest city in the known world, the Parak of Bakshiva decided to forge the most powerful weapon in the world to challenge the mighty white dragon. That seems like a bad idea. The white dragon's a good guy. Gal. The Parak had grown greedy and bored, his treasure hoard filled with the riches of the world, and he desired nothing except the one thing he could never have the unborn daughter of the white dragon, the fairest, purest, most beautiful creature in the universe. He had asked the white dragon for her daughter's hand in marriage, but she had refused, scolding him for his insolence and warning him to keep... And that's it? And, yeah, that guy sucks. It's a white dragon. She's part of, like, one of the key things about maintaining the balance and everything, and you're lusting after her unborn daughter? Gross. That's it, though, eh? We can't... Oh, yeah. Warning him to keep... His distance from immortals. And so the Parak sought the advice of a mighty sorcerer, the dark and cruel Eos, to learn how to kill one of the Dryad kin. Because he wants to marry her unborn daughter. This guy sucks. The sorcerer told the Parak of the white, the white silver of Mount Tyrone, the strongest substance in Arcadia, and how it could be forged by magic to kill even one of the kin. But why would you want to do that? Oh boy. The Parak ordered his army to go north, across the ocean, and to bring back enough white silver to shape a weapon. When his men returned with the rare metal, the Parak ordered the finest blacksmith in Bakshiva to his castle, where Eos the sorcerer cast a spell to create an unholy forge. Eos, you suck too. Ten days and ten nights it took before the exhausted blacksmith could present a tall spear to his emperor, but before the spear could be used to kill one of the kin, they had to be bathed in blood. Beheading the poor blacksmith and the soldiers who had retrieved the white silver from Mount Tyrone, the Parak's private bath was filled with their blood. As he dropped the silver spear into the red bath, watched over by Eos, a terrible scream erupted, and steam rose up in a foul, red, foul-smelling cloud. When the steam lifted, the blood was all gone, and the spear was glowing a deep red color. With the terrible weapon now ready to be wielded, the Parak issued a challenge to the white dragon, to either surrender her daughter to him for marriage, or to suffer a painful death at his hand. I hope she destroyed him. Enraged, the white dragon refused him yet again, and flew to meet the Parak, his sorcerer, and his thousand-strong army on the green fields outside Goromon. Of the magical silver spear, she knew nothing. Oh. 
and the parrot kept it wrapped in cloth by his side. Bring your forces around, Parrot warned the white dragon. If you do not, I will lay waste to them all. I wish my men no harm, lied the parrot, for this is between the two of us. He then rode forward, alone, and dismounted his horse, but stayed within reach of the spear. The white dragon landed before him, and she said, You are brave to face me like this when you know you cannot harm me. Then the parrot raised a hand as if to greet her, but it was instead assigned to his sorcerer, the terrible Aeos, who cast a mighty spell to hold the white dragon while the parrot drew his silver spear. The white dragon fought bravely, and she was close to escaping the sorcerer's magic, but the parrot was quick, and he thrust the magic spear into his chest. I hope something horrible happened to him and that she didn't die. She screamed in pain and anger, and the sorcerer's spell could no longer hold her. Rising on her beautiful wings, blood pouring down on the land below, she cursed back Shiva, her parrot, and her people for all time. Well, I feel bad, kind of, for the people, but the parrot had it coming. Wherever the white dragon's blood fell, the land turned arid, and grass became sand. The parrot sent his army to follow the white dragon and to bring back her egg, but the drought grew, and within days the once proud empire of Bakshiva was turning into a desert. Then followed a fierce storm that tore across the land for one hundred days and nights, and when the dust settled, there was nothing left of Bakshiva but two coastal cities and a few scattered oases. It is said that in the buried ruins of a lost capital, wrapped in the arms of the parrot who dared test the immortal, rests the silver spear of Goriman. A story. So a whole country full of people was destroyed just because this one guy was such a colossal turd sandwich. Are you done? Let me take that back for you. That was very interesting reading. Thank you. So what do we do? I kind of want to find the spear, but certainly not to use it against the white dragon. She's our ally. Um, I kind of just hate the idea of it being out there and possibly still a threat to her. Maybe we could use it to fight chaos? I don't know. It sounds like a nasty, cursed weapon that we're better off just not dealing with. Oh. <laughs> it's you again. The way she reached out to touch him, it looked like she kind of, like, grabbed him in the armpit. Tickle, tickle. Okay, some more books, please. Could I see some more books? Oh, certainly. What a silly question. All right, so... I am looking for so much information. Um, I want all of this. All right, right down the list, uh, leaving the top for last, actually. So, a book on the history of Mercuria would be interesting. Ah, an extensive subject, to be sure. I will do my best. Thank you. I trust you. I have a feeling that you know all your books quite well. Man, that dragon story really bothers me. You have this important creature. Like, she's necessary for the preservation of the whole world, and you're going to put it all in jeopardy. Because you want to have the most beautiful wife. Good grief. I did find something of interest. I'll leave it here for you to read. Thank you. I look like a serving maid. No, no, no. Maid. Run to the book. I look like a serving maid. All right, what do we got here? Travels in the Northlands by Jemaine the Discoverer, the first part. In my many years as a traveling poet and bard, I've journeyed far and wide across the fair realm of Arcady, and I've seen sights most people have not dreamed. I've stood on the magnificent and terrible southern capes in the midst of winter, when the storms are at their fiercest, while waves as tall as the towers of Alta Altaban washed over my frozen body. I have witnessed the monstrous beasts that lurk in those dark and deadly waters of the south swallow south swallow brave galleons whole, creatures the size of mountains that with a flick of a tail can touch the depths of the sea and the stars themselves. I have crossed the great ocean from north to south and from east to west, and in the course been stranded on desert islands, with no sustenance but what I could gather from the sparse vegetation for months at a time. I have ridden the giant Algwen across Changri Changagriel, the wasteland from Altaban to Monterba, Giant Algwan. Okay, so the Algwan are very big people? And further south, where the Turuk, the oasis, are few and far between, and I have seen the shifting dunes above the ruins of Goriman, precious jewel of Bakshivan. Oh! Do you have, like, a map or an idea where those ruins of Goriman were? Empire. Concealed for centuries by the coarse and treacherous sand. And I've journeyed far west, carried on goodwill and destiny by shadow ships, to the strange and unknown cliffs of a world unseen by most. A world of an unfamiliar tongue and customs, a world of great wonder and mysticism. 
I have seen all this and more, but the fairest sight still I have seen in the lands of the north, from Irene to the border mountains, from Tyron to the Bay of Fire. No sight can ever compare to dawn at Mount Tyrone, looking out to the plains of Nedra, where wild stallions run free in the thousands, and to look on the city of Coruscant, the Pearl of Fire, while the boiling sun sets in the ocean beyond, the slow waves reflecting dark yellow and red as they lap slowly upon the sandy shores is an experience truly treasured and there forgotten. These lands are blessed by the Creator, shaped by men, yet wild and free and fertile, home to the greatest cities, the most precious sites, and the most cultured and civilized people in Arcadia. Of all the fires I have rested my weary legs by, of all the taverns where I have learned the legends of tale spinners and memorized the songs of bards, of all the lands where I have wandered from city to village, it is to the Northlands I return, time and time again, to learn evermore. Join me now, for I will evoke in you the very emotions I first experienced when visiting the sights and treasures of the Northern Lands. Join me, and I will surely bring you there, to the exotic midst of this blessed land, and you will pine for its rugged coast and green woods and its hardy people, and like me, you will ne'er rest until you can return to yonder shores. Marcuria, O oh, Marcuria, thou unkempt diamond, of capitals thou art by truth the fairest. Thy counsel many seek, for knowledge, kept within, is centuries sought and gathered. By men wiser than the ages, brought hither, by word of mouth. Marcuria, changed thou not the course of war. Between thine people, diplomat, wise man, magician, all this and more, thou hast without equal the mark of merit and virtue, written by Germain Erthrin, the poet. The august capital of Irie, the unified country, Marcuria lies on the hardy southern coast of the Northlands, halfway between Tyron and Coruscant. It is a port of call for merchants, traders, adventurers, and pilgrims from all four continents, a place of commerce and diplomacy for millions of humans and other species. Irid is a strong and proud land, perched between the plains of Nadra to the north and the lands of the Tyrant to the west, the Great Sea to the south, and the forests of the Northlands to the east, and inhabited by humans, Dolmari, Tyrant, Mole people, and Veneer. Was it Veneer or was it Venner? Uh, I thought it was, you know, it was Venar, wasn't it? Irid was formed after Marcuria emerged as a major center for diplomacy and trade, and became the banner under which the surrounding lands united as one. Irid is a democracy currently led by the chief council of the Irid flag. Lord Igvin Dellen. The High Council, composed of the ministers who govern by representation, resides in the Marcurian Hall of Assembly, flanked by the palace and the barracks. The Irides are traditionalists, and their form of government has barely changed over the last few millennia. In high tongue, Iried means unification or assembly. Marcuria is one of the largest cities of Arcadia, the capital of Iried, and a center for trade, diplomacy, and cultural diversity. Populated by a large variety of races, from humans of Anir, Marcuria has grown from its origins as the birthplace of humanity to a city of all Arcadians and the hub of the civilized world. How many pages we got here? Founded 20,000 years ago at the shore of the then unconquerable ocean, that's quite a lot of history, it is the first known permanent settlement of the emerging human race. Initially left to its own devices by more developed races, Marcuria grew large and fat and wealthy. With newfound confidence, it passed through a period of expansion, which gained it, gained it a reputation as a merciless aggressor, which soon brought violent attention from the Tyrant in the west and the Dolmari in the, in the north. After years of war, Marcuria was decimated and subsequently rebuilt with sufficient reinforcements to weather attacks from both sea and land. Peaceful times followed, whereupon Marcuria settled into the role it has in today's Arcadia. Although all surrounding areas fall under its jurisdiction, there is sufficient self-governing and few central taxes to appease all but the most disgruntled. The huge areas of farmland around the city benefit from the well-kept roads, markets, and the busy export to other lands. Nearby villages benefit from the military might of Marcuria, protecting them against roving barbarians and tyrant armies. And Marcuria always provides, also provides the people of the Northlands with one of the best and busiest ports in Arcadia, allowing travel to distant destinations around the world. Oof, that was quite a lot of Are you done? Uh, let me take that back for you. Thank you. Now then. Oh. <laughs> oh, goodness, it's you again. Oh, you gave me such a fright. So this time... Oh, we lost our option for the... I'm not sure what I need. Well, this probably replaces it and gets us the same. Could I see some results? more books? Oh, certainly. What a silly question. Or no, that was the one that leads us then to the next one. Goodness. Okay, um, yeah, I do want to read some folk tales. I'd like to read some Arcadian folk tales. 
A favorite topic of mine. I have just what you're looking for. Excellent. So I'm feeling like we should probably find that spear. But I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. But we did have that whole story about it. Although we have to be careful if we find it, because when we find the dragon, I can't imagine I she find something of interest. wants much to do I'll with the spear. Other than possibly to destroy it. And so after all this time, is her daughter still unborn? Sadra, the faithful wife. Sadra was married to a brood of a man named Kerr. Care or carry? Eh. He was a bully who drank, cursed, gambled, and beat up his wife when he'd lost coins at the cup's table. That's terrible. Still, Sadra treated Care with respect and care. She fed him when he was hungry, she made his bed and washed his back, and she laid down with him when he told her to. She never complained of her hardships to anyone, even though someday she woke up with bruises all over her body. Despite her husband's treatment, Sadra was a beautiful woman, with lovely dark hair and green eyes, and men would admire her when she went to the market for food. Or the town- This story's starting out- they, they got some rough stories here. This is horrible. The beautiful part is irrelevant. All of this just- Man, she puts up with all this garbage from him. Or the town well for water. But none dared approach her, fearing her dangerous husband more than they admired her beauty and grace. Which is probably smart, because if they approached her, then he'd probably take out all of his jealousy on her and just beat her more. People would say, poor Sadra, she deserves better than what she has. She is so good and patient, even though her husband mistreats her every day. But no one was willing to do anything to free her from her husband, as they all feared his wrath. Which So no one's going to stand up for her. She chooses her own path, they would say, and it is not our duty to interfere. Well, what if she feels like she doesn't have options? What if she feels trapped in the... Uh... Then one day, a tall and handsome prince rode into town to visit with the Elder Council. When he spotted Sadra carrying two heavy buckets from the well to her home on the edge of town, he was taken with her beauty and youth, and he jumped down from his horse to help carry her buckets home. On the way, he offered Sadra courtship, but when she told him she was already married, he bowed respectfully and excused himself for acting inappropriately. That night, Sadra's husband heard about the prince helping his wife, and after striking her down for letting royalty interfere with her duties, he strode drunkenly, for he had already had his usual fill of dark ale, towards the tavern where the prince and his cohorts were staying. This is a bad idea. When Kerr arrived, arri arrived at the tavern, the prince was eating dinner, and when told Sadra's husband was there to see him, the prince stood and waved the man closer. I must congratulate you on your good taste in marriage, said the prince. For your wife is the most beautiful and good-hearted woman I have ever met. And then he offered Kerry a... Carrie, do we want to go, Carrie? Whatever. A seat and a tall mug of ale. But the angry husband did not appreciate the prince's advances, even though the prince said he was sorry when he realized, and he drew a sword and lunged at the prince before his guards could react. The prince was quick and lucky to avoid certain death, and before Kerry could make a second strike, the prince had recovered his sword from where it stood by the wall and stood ready to fight the brute. Leave him be, called the prince, when his guards drew arms and ran to protect their liege. This is between him and me. Smiling briefly, he nodded his head to Kerry and stood to attention. Obviously, his skill with the sword was formidable. Kerr, a coward at heart, knew that if he fought fairly, he would surely die, and he sheathed his sword but loosened the knife he had tucked up his long sleeve. My pardon, Prince, said Kerr. My love for my wife is such that I am blinded by jealousy. That's not how love actually works. I offer you friendship and apologies. He extended an open hand to the prince and smiled a broad lizard smile. The prince, unaware of Kerr's mistreatment of his faithful wife, smiled back, put down his sword, and extended his own hand. Your apologies accepted, sir. Then, suddenly, Kerr's knife was in his hand and moving in a blur toward the prince's exposed throat. Had it not been for the quick eye of a nearby guard, who with the broad side of his sword struck Kerr on the side of his head, the prince would have been dead. The knife carved a deep scar on the prince's shoulder, but did no serious harm. Kerr was taken away to the town's prison to be judged when the sun rose. His crime was surely punishable by death, especially if Sadra would testify to his cruelty in front of the judge. Free of Kerr's tyranny, the townspeople now spoke of Sadra's suffering by her husband's hand. Why didn't anybody speak up beforehand? Were there be any laws that would have intervened and would have helped her if anyone had bothered? But Sadra would not herself, even now, speak against her husband, and instead of being sentenced to death, Kerr was sent away to work the Keen's mines for 25 years. Taken with her faithfulness, or maybe it's just fear, since she's lived the whole time meekly with this guy who beats on her, the prince yet again offered Sadra courtship, but again Sadra declined, for she was still a married woman. Which is a good point, like, okay, prince, we get it, you're into her, but... 
you know, she is married, and how interested is she in the prince? Then, one year later, Kara attempted to escape the king's mines by killing two guards and climbing the walls, but he was shot down with an arrow and died in agony and disgrace. Which, good, he's a piece of crap and he deserves it. Again, the prince visited Sadra's town, bringing condolences and a renewed offer of courtship, and this time Sadra agreed. Months later, the prince and Sadra were married in a glorious ceremony, and when the old king died, the prince became regent and Sadra his queen. She was as good a queen as the land had ever seen, and she was loved dearly until the day she died. And her funeral was the grandest and most cheerful in memory. Okay. Odd story. Not sure I like that story or not. A lot of unpleasantness there. Alright, the children of the lake. There was a village by a lake where no couple had borne a child for twenty years. The villagers were desperate, for without children their village would wither and die, and they turned to their god for help. The next morning, fifty young children rose out of the misty lake and wandered onto the shores, much to the joy of the childless women. We are yours, said one of the children, as long as you remember one thing. You are never to fish from this lake again. Instead, you must learn to hunt in the forest and live off the land. The villagers agreed, though they worried they might go hungry, since they were used to catching and eating fish from the lake. But it didn't take long before they had taught themselves to hunt and grow wheat and potatoes in the fields. Eighteen years passed, and then one day an old man grew tired of rabbits and deer and potatoes and bread, and he longed to catch a big fish and cook it over a sizzling fire. We'll go anywhere other than the lake, then. He took his boat out to where the villagers would not see him, and he sank his line. Almost immediately he caught a large trout, but as he was rolling back to shore, he saw the children of the lake wander from their homes back into the dark waters from whence they came. Their mothers called for them, tried to hold on to them, begged them not to leave, but they would not speak, and one by one they disappeared into the lake. The old fishermen then saw, as the children sank into the murky waters, how they turned into large fish and sped off into the deep. He was shameful then and dropped his catch back in the water, but it was too late and the village would forever and more remain childless. Wait, look, that's the only lake in the world, guy? You couldn't go anywhere else? Are you done? Let me take that back for you. Interesting story, though. I guess the first story, like, I mean, I, I, it's cool that she ended up all queen and everything, and everything worked out well in her life, but man, that's a rough story about enduring just years of abuse. Crappy. Alright, you. Oh! Oh, goodness, it's you again. Oh, you gave me such a fright. I know, I'm a startling creature. So. Could I see some more books? Oh, certainly. What a silly question. Now then, this time... I'm looking for some information, but I'm not sure which book to ask for. No matter. I know a great deal about most of the books in here. What topic intrigues you? Well... There's so many things. Okay. Oh, I do want to know about the mermen. And I need to know about the magical peoples of Arcadia. And the dragon. All of it. Uh, let's start with the mermen. I've heard rumors about mermen who live beneath the Sea of Songs, and I'd like to find out more about them. Mermen in the Sea of Songs. Hmm. Uh, let me see what I can find, yes? Alrighty. I did find something of interest. I'll leave it here for you to read. All right, let's see what we got this time. Merom, also mermen, merpeople, merians. A magical people who reside in the depths of the great ocean and other seas. Little contact has been made with the Merom, who are believed to have been quite numerous in the past, but are now dwindling in numbers. Confirmed location of Merum cities is between the Briston Atoll and Gien. Gien, centering on the Sea of Songs. Legends of mermen, merpeople, merians, are rampant amongst sailors. These stories portray the Merum in a grotesque and violent light, betraying the truth of a largely peaceful people. Oh. Although not much is known about the Merum, their religion apparently centers around the belief of, benef of a benevolent god who lives in the immense depths of the great ocean and who brought the Merum to Earth from a place distant and wonderful. Oh, so they're from somewhere else entirely. Let me take that back for you. It's kind of cool. 
And that also makes me more hopeful about talking to them and their god who fell from the sky, because that book's telling us they're not actually people eaters, as our old sailor said. Oh! Oh, goodness, it's you again. Oh, you gave me such a fright. So then... Could I see some more books? Oh, certainly. What a silly question. I'm looking for some information, but I'm not sure which book to ask for. No matter. I know a great deal about most of the books in here. What topic intrigues you? Well, now I would like to know... about... I need to find out which four magical people of Arcadia were given a piece of the stone disc that serves as the key to the Guardian's realm. The stone disc of the balance, yes? Yes, yes. There, there could possibly be something on that in... Uh, um, uh, let me check. Just one moment. You know what? I gotta say, thank you so much. This guy is... he's so useful. Tobias is all... Mm, you could probably just go look that up at the library somewhere. Go figure it out. Do some research. This fella, he's like, oh yeah, I'll get right on it. I will find exactly the book you need for you. I did find something of interest. I'll leave it here for you to read. Excellent. Chapter 16 in the 8th scripture, the scripture of breaking, regarding the disc of the balance and the events that came about when the disc was broken. The scriptures tell us that the disc was kept at the Enclave for many thousands of years, safely guarded from any threat by the respect held by every man and woman for the authority of the fathers. But with dissent came disobedience, and disobedience brought immorality, and immorality begat theft. Tyrant soldiers, aided by sentinel traitors, oh attempted to make away with the disc, but were thwarted by the white of the kin herself, intervening, although forbidden to do so, on behalf of the fathers. That was forbidden? The disc was brought safely back to the Enclave, but the threat would linger in the minds of the Minstrum and the Vestrum. So it became that the disc was melted in the forge of the dragon's mouth, shaped into the elements of four magical people, and given to these respective people for safekeeping, until such a time when it was decreed that the disc should once more be whole. One stone to the gentle souls that sing in the dark and shape the earth between their toes. One stone to the watchers of the woods, the ones who are outside. One stone to the two that make one, of air and of sea. And and one stone to the keepers of the dark flame, the eternally dark, the mariners. Okay, so that's our god at the bottom of the sea, right? The merfolk? When the time comes for the disc to be whole again, one person will make a journey to the four who hold the pieces, and the pieces will be given win willingly, because there will be no doubt to the righteousness of this person. Alrighty, so we just gotta find the places to go, and um, according to the scriptures here, done? they're just gonna give us Let what me we take need. That back for you. It seems unlikely that it will actually be that easy, but you know, we can hope. Alright. One more book I think you got for me. Goodness, it's you again. Oh, you gave me such a fright. So, could I see some more books? Oh, certainly. What is it? Skip that a little bit. Looking for I'm looking for some. No matter. And I would like to learn more about the dragon. I'd like to learn more about dragons, about the dragon. Oh, yes, yes. We have some wonderful books on that topic. Stay here. Okay. How many books is he grabbing? Okay, it looks like just the one. I did find something of interest. I'll leave it here for you to read. Alrighty, let's see what we got this time. Secrets of the Dryad Kin by Minstrum Eliot. Forward. The Dryad Kin are known by many names throughout the Twin Worlds. 
In Old Tongue, they are often referred to as Drakken. In some variations of Low Tongue, Draken. In the Southlands, the word Dragic, Dragic, something along those lines, refers specifically to the winged lizard shape traditionally associated with the kin. In Erhad, the eternal spirits of the kin are called simply Drak. Eternal spirits of the kin? Oh no, in Erhad. Regardless of their current shape. In Stark, most cultures refer to the kin as dragon. Dragon, Drak, Dragon. Though this usually refers only to the winged lizard-like shape and not to the spirit inhabiting this shape. In fact, while in Arcady, the kin are respected and revered as eternal spirits with great significance in the balance and the all. Okay, so I read that. In fact, while in Arcady, they, uh, blah, blah. in Stark, the kin are mostly creatures of mythology and fairy tales. However, in some Stark legends and scriptures, notably the Christian Bible, the name dragon is associated with the forces of evil, and thus the religious connotations do seem to have carried over in a somewhat distorted form. Who or what are the dry kin? Only somewhat? Evil is only somewhat distorted, huh? That's interesting. Why not ask, who is the creator? Or what is the all? Questions thus asked will remain, in perpetuity, unanswered, for they are in truth unanswerable. To condense all knowledge of the creator into one answer is futile, as is any attempt to define the all without describing every single element that makes up the all. So also with the dry kin. We cannot answer, who is the kin? Or what is the kin? But we can provide some answers to the simpler questions, the questions that deal with what we see and hear and feel, and what we have been told by the kin themselves. Answers that, together, may give us, if only the faintest hint of the whole truth, then at least some indication of who or what the drag kin are. Born of the emptiness between the stars, reads the eleventh scripture of the balance, the scripture of time. Shaped in unison with the all, part of the all, yet outside the all. Drake kin, note the ancient high tongue variation of drag kin, why so many variations and interpretations of the dry kin from culture to culture? The kin have always been shrouded in mystery, and from mystery arises legend and myth. The kin seem content to be seen as nothing but tall tales and figments of a bard's fertile imagination. Are you done? Let me take that back for yeah, you. Yeah, go for it. That, I don't know. I'm not sure how useful that really was, but... Alright, well, we did a lot of research. I think we found some, perhaps, useful information. Alright, so, I think I'm going to go ahead and wind the episode down here. Please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this. Come back, and what do we want to do next time? I kind of want to talk to Tobias again, and because um, this guy happened to mention that Tobias had the uh, second scripture, so maybe we can come up with something on that if we remind him that he's got it. And I do want to see if maybe... All of our time studying in here has advanced time outside in the world around us, and perhaps we can go back to, like, the journeyman and look for Tunlayak. I'm also interested if, after all of this reading, if it's opened up any new map spots for us. So we'll check that out, too.